The winter of 2015 was incredibly dry, leading to our hottest, driest vintage ever in 2016, where everything came in. It was like, you know, it was like a, um, it was like a race course out there, like a picture of a horse race, and you didn't know which was going to come in first, and all of a sudden, this one was faster, and that one was slower, and yeah, was yeah. Har harvest was finished in like 10 days total. It was crazy. Um, amazing intensity in those wines, though, for that reason, if, if you were able to get them in quick enough. Um, and then 2017, we called a bounce back vintage because the vines were much more adjusted. So even though it was as hot and as dry, we were able to get a, an amazing um, recovery in the vineyards. So yields were still low. You know, we were still down and still have been down about up to 60% in our vineyards, actually up to more on average, about 60% in our vineyards. So again, great concentration, but a little bit better, the balance in the wine in 2017. So that leads us up to 2018, um, specifically for the reds. And one of the, the most amazing things was it wasn't just about flavor balance. In 2018, we started to see a recovery of the analysis as well. So the analytical balance that obviously goes hand in hand with the, you know, the flavor, the mouthfeel, the freshness of the wine, because we're in a hot, dry place. And so to be able to make wines with freshness and finesse is always the, the ultimate expression of what we're trying to achieve. So the 2018 Syrahs that you will have in front of you um, have now recovered even more from, from the 2017 vintage. So the 2017 being much more voluptuous, the 2018s um, have this restraint, this amazing um, kind of world-class longevity that we're going to expect from them. And then going into the 2019 vintage, um, the Shannons that are in front of you, 2019 was um, a little bit cooler than 2018 and slightly later of a start than 2018. Um, but what it really was amazing for was being able to pick when we wanted to pick. Because of that slightly cooler beginning of harvest, it stretched out much longer. So for the white wines in particular, there wasn't this crunch and this rush to get them all in. So that's just a little bit of a background um, to what we're going to start tasting. It's still in the, in the big picture, still two pretty dry vintages if you compare it to, you know, back to 2015 or 14. In, in the big, big scheme of things, they're still really dry vintages. Incredibly here. dry. So still 60% down on average on yields, you know, um, thicker skins, smaller berries, less juice. Yeah. So that's just all a little preamble into what we're about oh. to taste. Um, so you, you were just asking which order we're going to taste in. So if, you, if you're lining everything up, it'll be granite, shannon, quartz, shannon, and then granite, schist, and iron, syrup. So that, that will be the, the order that we'll taste in. Um, maybe, yeah, just a little bit about the farming. Obviously, what, what we're really trying to do is, is express the Swatland and these special sites in the, in the wines. So it really starts with a sort of a, has reasoned a sensible farming uh, practice that we can in the vineyard. So it's all about, you know, starting with the, the, the life and the health of the soil. So planting cover crops, um, using mulches in the vineyards to, to build organic matter and, and sort of natural food for the vines in the soil itself. Um, also to help with the water retention capacity in the soil. Um, and then obviously we, we don't use any fertilizers. So it's, it's all man-made or with composts that we make ourselves. Um, that we that we put in the vineyards um, and then most of the vineyards are dry farmed so on Castilburg here a lot of the younger vineyards are irrigated uh, drip irrigation but most of the vineyards are, are dry farmed I mean if all of the Paderberg vineyards for the granite syrup and Shenham and all of the iron vineyards are, are all dry farmed um, and then yeah we, we we're very fortunate here in the Swatland to have a really balanced um, sort of it's not a monoculture of, of just vines everywhere. There's, there are vineyards, but then there's wheat and there's feinbos and there's olives. So there's a lovely diversity of, of, of fauna and flora in the, in the region. So the disease pressure is relatively low and that lets us get away with, without having to, to spray a lot in the vineyard. So, so it's really a, a lovely place for, for more natural farming. And that really allows us to, to harvest fruit that's, you know, we have moderate uh, crop levels. They're not super high. And combined with being a lot of them old vines gives a lot of richness and intensity, but it's a balanced intensity in the, in the fruit. So, so wonderful concentration, but, but a balanced concentration. So by farming a bit more sort of naturally and sensibly, we, we keep the vines in a, in a great balance 
and they really reflect the terroir that the, that the, the vines are planted in. And then Andrea, obviously, when it comes into the winery, tries to follow that, that same philosophy uh, as far as possible in the, in the winemaking. Yeah, so, I mean, obviously, with the healthy grapes, the fact that we're not having to spray um, things that we shouldn't be spraying in the vineyards, it maintains a super healthy natural yeast culture. So when the grapes come in, they already have all the yeast, all the natural nutrients, everything the grape needs to ferment comes in with the grape itself. And, and so that means that we are able to be as hands-off as possible in the winery. So obviously we're making decisions about, you know, when to pick, um, how to process the fruit, um, when to press, when to punch down. But the idea is when each of these parcels come in, so all of the white wines will be treated the same for the single soil wines. All of the red wines, all the Syrahs will be treated the same for, for the single soil wines. So that way, that expression of the soil is what's coming out the strongest. Um, you know, that fingerprint of terroir is predominantly based on the soil itself um, for these wines in the Swartland. Yeah. Um, and that's why we make them each every year, um, but we don't bottle them each every year. So we want it to be that geeky expression of that variety on that soil type in the Swartland. Um, and if at the end of the day, after two years, it's not ticking all those boxes, we won't put it in the bottle. So we want these wines to be, you know, exclusive and rare, honest expressions and so because of that the amount of wine that's made every year does vary um so in these more difficult um drier years with the lower yields uh the white wines for example are <laughs> like half the production that we've made previously but we don't want to put something in bottle um just to write granite or quartz yeah. on it we want them to be those honest expressions so that's why we do have um much less of some of the wines um especially this year yeah well, and then, um, yeah, Angela was just asking for an update on the 2020 season, so the winter so far. It's been an interesting kind of up and down winter. Um, we had some really nice early rain and it got really nice and cold early on. Um, and then we had quite a warm uh, June. So some of the vines actually have started budding a little bit right at, at the top here and there, which is not obviously ideal. Um, but luckily it's been extremely cold uh, this week and it looks like we can have another cold week next week. Um, we've had good rains. Um, the soils are definitely saturated. You know, when, when you're in the vineyards, you can see the, the, the soil is saturated. The, the rain has seeped in and, and we call it field capacity. So basically the, all, the, all the air in the soil has been replaced by, by water. So the soils are, are saturated, which is great. Um, but the, our, our dams here in the Swatland are not all full yet. Um, so here on Roundstone, we have two dams. The one is about 80% and the other is about 60%. We've had probably about just over 300, maybe 310 mils of rain so far. And for us, normally at Roundstone, it's about 450. So we still need another 100, 150 mils of rain um, to make it a, a normal winter, an average winter. Um, but it's well above what we had in, in 2016, which was just over 200 mils of rain. So, so it's, it's an okay winter so far, but we, we definitely, we're not done yet in terms of how much, how much moisture we need that that's for sure. Yeah. So it's been beautifully cool. And there are some other physical nature signs that it's going to be a long, cool spring. Mm -hmm. So, so we don't want it too wet, you know, close to the, so, yeah, the growing too season. late into the spring. Um, the cool weather will be amazing for the health, the longevity, the, the natural acidity in the vines. And, we, and we've already started seeing that reflect into the, the 2020 vintage wines. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I think we need to start tasting. Yes, we yeah. do. <laughs> so, yeah, so, so we've, we've got five wines here. Um, and we're, we, we've opened these. Um, we opened these a couple of days ago, actually. So Andrew and I have been tasting those over a few days just to get our, yeah, the tasting notes and everything together. Um, so we'll be tasting first the, the granite Shannon. Uh, sorry, the light's not great here. But, uh, <laughs> and then next, uh, the next, next the quartz Shannon. Um, and yeah, to start with the granite, the granite Shannon is always from the Paderberg. Um, the Paderberg is, is the huge decomposed granite outcrop that, that we have in the, the southern part of the Swatland. Um, and this is a really old mountain. It's about 400 million years old. So was kind of formed when South America 
basically collided with with Africa 400 million years ago when Gondwana land was a was a continent and as the two continents collided the the magma pushed up along the fault line and it left these granite outcrops so Paul Mountain the Paderberg Darling Hills all the way to Saldana Bay and then you can draw a straight line all the way down to to Cape Orgullis where there are these granite outcrops um, and the Paderberg Mountain is is one of the larger one of these outcrops um, granite is a very hard rock. Obviously, if you think of um, you know table counters and and things, it's it's a really hard rock. Um, and if you visit granite vineyards in Europe, they're much younger. So Cornas and Hermitage are good examples in the Northern Rhone. Um, they actually tend to be quite shallow, rocky soils that give a lot of structure and intensity to the wines there. Here in in the Paderberg, because our soils are so much older. The, the granite is much more weathered, so it's, it's basically decomposed, as we say, into sand. Uh, got one. Oh, no. no, we don't have it yet. Okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's basically turned into almost what looks like beach sand. Um, so it's very, very deep soil, very weathered, and, and the vines have a huge root system that, in fact, works really well because it buffers them against the warm, dry conditions we have here. So they're, the vines are always slightly larger. I'll actually call up a couple of pictures here quickly while I'm talking. Um, and that helps them to, to retain a, a pretty good acidity here in the Swatland. So, so that's really important um, with, with especially white wine where you want freshness. Uh, you, you, want, you want the wine to obviously be intense and have texture and, and, and complexity, but acidity is really important. So, so this is a great example of, of a Paderberg vineyard. And this, this is the, the granite Shannon vineyard that we use for the, for the granite Shannon. So it's on a ridge here uh, on the Paderberg, sort of on the, on the edge of the Apulse Cliff, facing, actually facing the west coast. So in the background there, you can see, you can see Table Mountain. So it's really right on the, one of the top of the, the higher elevations in the Paderberg. But these are super deep soils. They're yeah, three, four meters deep. And the, the vines just uh, yeah, keep a wonderful freshness to them. You'll also see the, the vines are, the, it kind of makes an umbrella. I think the next picture shows this part. Yeah. So the, the, the vines actually almost make it like an umbrella that shades the grapes. So the, there's a nice kind of big canopy, a lot of leaves and the, the bunches, they're exposed to the light, but they also sit a little bit in the shade. And if you think of grapes, if they stand in the sun, you get much more sort of dark golden color and you get um, stone fruit aromatics like peaches and apricots. But in the granite shen, and because the bunches are a little bit more in the shade, the bunches stay a slightly more yellowy, almost greenish tinge, and they keep more sort of flinty and citrusy aromatics. So, so when we're talking about the granite shen, and obviously the acidity is super important. It's, it's always a very, very linear, very lean, very fresh style of Shannon for, for the Swatland. Um, obviously it's balanced by a wonderful texture, but at the same time, the aromatics are definitely dominated by those citrus, those flinty aromatics um, that, that, yeah, that are a result of how the vines grow. So it's, it's not us trying to force the wine to, to taste fresh and to force it to taste citrusy or flinty. It's, it's really um, an, a function of how the vines grow and how the, the fruit is exposed to sunlight. That that's, really the fundamental thing about how the, the granite Shannon um, has its character, yeah. So, yeah, as you can see, these are dry farm bush vines, yeah. Cool. Um, and then the court Shannon, Andrew, you've got that in your glass. Um, court Shannon is, the, these are on the lower slopes of Castilberg Mountain. So that photo on our screen is a little bit bright, but that's okay. Uh, I think it gives a good idea of the soil. So the quartz vineyards are on the lower slopes of Castilberg Mountain. So these are uh, on, basically the lowest slopes of Roundstone where we are. Um, and Castilberg is also a super old mountain, also about 400 million years old. And uh, so when South America collided with Africa, these huge mountains got pushed up and, uh, and Castilberg was actually joined to Table Mountain by one massive mountain. And uh, that's eroded over these 400 million years. And what's happened is at the bottom foothills, you have all the, the slate or schist that's been eroding, forms quite a deep soil. It's, it's about also about two, three meters deep with a lot of clay. So it makes a wine with quite a lot of power, a lot of texture, a lot of richness um, on the palate, a lot of density, um, but balanced by good acidity because the vines are, have a nice deep soil to grow in. 
they're able to find moisture and, and keep a good acidity. But what you find is on the surface, there's a layer of these white quartz rocks. And quartz is a very, very hard rock. Um, so it's also 400 million years old, but it's, it's, it weathers much more slowly than the schist. So as the mountain's eroding, the quartz rocks move down the mountain and form this layer of, of rocks uh, on the surface. And that reflects a lot of sunlight. So as I was talking about the granite, where the bunches are a little bit in the shade and, and you keep a little bit more sort of green and citrusy aromatics, on the quartz, because of all this light intensity, the, the bunches are a bit more golden, they're yellow, and you get more, much more sort of stone fruit on the nose. So, so think of you know, apricots, peaches, uh, th those kind of things. You do get a bit of citrus and a bit of spice, um, but it's a slightly more yellow citrus, I suppose, than, than, a, than limes, uh, for, for want of a better word. I always say that um, for the spice, it's, it's that like sun reflection. It's that like white spice that yeah. sort of, you know, when you take two pieces, you know, quartz is, is the same um, base element as, as flint. And if you take two pieces of flint and strike them together, two pieces of quartz and strike them together, you get a spark. And it's that, that energy, that capturing of the sun and being able to re-release it back into the environment again, that for me is actually an expression of the quartz when we're tasting it. Yes. So in terms of what's happening in the winery with these two, I had already mentioned that everything is natural yeast and natural mallow because we want them to be, um, you know, just that extra expression of the terroir. We don't want to interfere by, by adding things to the wine. You know, all the, the, the nutrients is naturally there in the vineyard coming in on the grapes, in the skins. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we had, you know, lower yields this year, but also low recovery. Recovery is what we refer to as the amount of juice you get for every ton you harvest. So for white grapes, you typically get up to 70% uh, recovery. Um, so 700 liters of wine for every ton of grapes you pick. With these in this year, it was about 55% on average and, and um, lower in the quart soils. Um, again, because of that, that sun expression. So what that means is that there was a lot of um, matter in the grapes. Um, you know, they're more gummy, more viscous. And that translates through eventually into extract as well. Mm -hmm. So these wines, even though um, the granite is one of the freshest granites we've had in a while, it also has the highest extract we've had in a while. It's an amazing balance. Um, but the, as I mentioned, the natural yeast and the natural mallow. So it's all whole bunch pressing. Um, all, we're doing it whole bunch to be protective of releasing um, negative characters because at the end of the day, it, we are uh, trying to pick fresher, uh, but we don't want anything that's not perfect in the skins to be coming out. So we're doing whole bunch pressing for that reason but they are very oxidative fermentation styles. We're not trying to aim for, you know, tons of primary fruit. There is primary fruit, but that's just because of the natural, you know, sunshine environment that we have, um, but we're not trying to, to uh, protect that primary character. Um, so it is more oxidative fermentations in older barrels. We don't want wood to be one of the flavor components that you're tasting. Again, we want it to be just the soils that are making the difference. And the um, uh, one dose of sulfur pretty much before bottling, uh, because we want all of that natural evolution to happen. So there was a question just about the production levels of the wine. So um, the, the two Shannons are about just over 2000 bottles each, I think 2400 bottles about. Uh, the iron Syrah is about the same, I think just over 2,400 bottles. And then the Schist Syrah and Granite Syrah are pushing, so just under 5,000 bottles each. So, so yeah, one of our smaller vintages for sure, especially of the, the iron Syrah and the two Shannons. It's, it's uh, yeah, really a function of the drought. And I think you know, one of the things Andrea mentioned there is quite interesting. The, you know, with, with the drought, the yields have come down. So the, the, the sort of the tons per hectare we get off the vineyards have come down significantly by 60%. But then also in the winery, that's further compounded by from a ton of grapes, it's concentrated even more because our recovery is less. So yeah, so I remember, you know, getting the, when Andrea does the pressing, I get the number of liters and how many barrels are full. And I'm like, Andrea, there's a mistake here. Where there is. <laughs> and she's like, no, no, no. And I was like, you've got to press harder. And she's like, I can't. I'm just, it's, this is it. Yeah. So, yeah. We don't want to compromise quality. Mm -hmm. 
but essentially it means that the weight of the grapes is made up by the stems, the skins, and the pips, yeah. not by the juice itself. Yeah, yeah, very cool. Um, yeah, so anything else? I mean, Andrew, I, th I think these two are really great examples of, of quartz and, and granite together. Um, the, the granite is it's an interesting wine because if you analytically look at it, it has a lot of extract, a lot of texture and concentration. But it's also, I think, the highest acidity we've, we've had in our granite Shannon before. It's, it's over seven grams a liter, which for us in the Swatland is extremely high. Um, so it's really a, a very, very powerful one. It's got a lot of concentration, a lot of richness, but that's balanced at the same time with a, a lot of acidity and a lot of freshness. So I think it's, it's a really great example of a very vibrant, very energetic granite Shannon. And then the quartz is really just itself. It's it's got stone fruit on the nose. It's got a wonderful texture. So it's, it's, it's got a nice creaminess to it. Um, and then, yeah, it's, it's powerful, but it has, again, a nice fresh cleanness. Um, so yeah, I think two really great examples of what granite Shannon and quartz Shannon should be in a, in a, in a good vintage. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the, that, um, the extra freshness that's in the wines is just exactly what I was talking about, how the vineyards, these you know, old vine, dry land, Swartland Shannon vines have just really um, bounced back. So even though it, it's still been, you know, hot and dry, um, the vines, it's not their first rodeo. They've done this before. And it just shows you how resilient the vineyards are, um, especially when farmed um, sustainably. Cool. Can you pass me the cork through there? That's okay. So yeah, we're, we're gonna move on to, to taste the, um, the reds. Uh, I'm not trying to rush you guys, but we're, we're excited to taste them. So, um, yeah, the, we'll start with the granite syrup first. Um, and maybe, Andrea, yeah, just, just refresh us about the 2018 vintage. Yeah, so the 2018 was a little bit more compounded than the 2019 in that, um, you know, again, the theme of drought, warm and dry, but it wasn't as warm as previous um, vintages of the drought. Uh, but it was a bit more of a crunch to get the Syrah in um, before uh, slightly more negative weather that was going to be coming up on the horizon. Um, so people who were farming later ripening varieties, especially in cooler regions, struggled with the end of the vintage in 2018. There was a bit more disease pressure. But in um, uh, for the Syrahs, they are naturally a uh, earlier ripening variety, and in the Swartland, obviously, things are all a little bit earlier. We start picking these usually around the second week of February, and it's about a about a ten day um, harvesting time for for all of our Syrahs. Um, we do have some that we can pick um, slightly earlier in sugar level. Some that naturally express best at a slightly higher sugar level. But the reason why these three vineyards that we're going to taste now are chosen as our three single soil um, and single vineyard um, Syrahs are because they all ripen about the same sugar level. So although there is variances in the natural um, microbes, so the yeast and the malolactic bacteria, um, they're at the same sugar level, they're about the same age, um, it's the same people working in the vineyards and the exact same winemaking. Um, and that's what allows us to be able to pick them at the same time and really express the soil type. So yeah, so we're going to taste, uh, taste the, the granite syrup. <laughs> um, so granite syrup, and this is from a single vineyard in the Paderberg mountain. So um, again, granite soils are, are on the, the, the decomposed granite uh, soils of the, of the Paderberg. Um, we have over time used a few different vineyards for the granite syrup, but since about 2015, We've settled on a single vineyard in the, on the farm called Jakosfontein, which is kind of between Lammersuk and Adi Badenhorst's vineyard. Uh, it's a wonderful vineyard, a little bit, a little bit older than most other Syrah um, that's around. It's, it's in its 20s. So not old vines yet, but they're just wonderful bush vines, dry farm that are just in a brilliant balance. Um, and like the granite Shenan, these vines have a huge root system um, that buffers the vines against these warm, dry conditions. The, the vine again makes, a, oh, actually I'll show you some pictures again, makes a lovely sort of umbrella that uh, allows the, the bunches to sort of half sit in the, a little bit in the sun, but also in the direct sunlight that's shining down in the, in the day, the berries are also sitting in the shade. So they're, you do get some fruit in the wine, but it's generally a lot more 
sort of floral and spicy on the nose as opposed to being about dark fruit and and uh yeah other things so so the the yeah again dry farm bush vines very very deep soils and i think 2018 is is a very interesting granite syrup and we've been tasting it over the last few weeks and um it's in my opinion the sort of tightest most austere granite syrup we produce today or in fact any syrup we produce today it's really it's got quite a kind of a an angular uh, tight freshness to it so it's, it's really probably one of the syrups we, we bottle to date that's that's um, gonna really benefit from decanting when drunk young um, it's obviously got the typical aromatics of, of uh, you know we, we don't really get white pepper in the Scotland it's more sort of a, a black or dark pepper um, also bell pepper so, so sort of red slightly on the red spectrum and then that wonderful floral character on the on the nose so it's it's a yeah, more sort of perfumed and spicy aromatic profile and then if you taste on the palate you'll see what i mean it, it's it's really tight and austere it's um almost maybe nebbiolo-esque in terms of how, how it's got this really firm iron kind of yeah very very structured tannin to it so i'm really excited to see how this wine is going to develop over time because i think out of all the syrups we produce today it's going to be the the slowest, most gradual aging of the of them all. And it's so something we've always said about the granite Syrah is it's it's the most linear aging wine, um, and this one just really on the world stage has that like yeah. ageability to it. Um, so I I love drinking wines like this young because you can see the potential. But it's only I like drinking from young because we have other bottles we can taste. <laughs> so, but I think that those who have the little bottles today, it'll have really benefited from the fact that we yeah. decanted them into those bottles yesterday. And um, people are pushing for us to sell those little bottles, but those are not for aging. Those are for drinking now. So I hope you're enjoying them. Um, so the yeah, really just as a question of uh, the reds whole bunch pressed or whole bunch fermented. Yeah. yeah. So I'll talk about the winemaking for all three right now. Um, so that as we talk about the wines, you can sort of see them happening. So as mentioned, they're they're picked at the same ripeness and they are fermented all identically. So um, the wines are crushed whole bunch. Um, so foot stomped to be as gentle as possible, but I don't want any carbonic maceration. For me, doing the whole cluster fermentation puts a magnifying glass on those soil types. So everything that we're looking for in granite, those that floral and those linear tannins um, come out like a magnet with a magnifying glass if you do it whole cluster. Um, and then the same with the schist and the iron. So for me, one of the distinguishing differences between these wines are the tannins. Um, I'm such a tannin nerd, as people know. So, so when I'm fermenting these wines, I'm thinking about what the structure of the soil wants to give to the structure of the wine. And that inherently will then come with aromatics as well. But it mustn't be about what I want. It's about what the grapes, what the vineyards want to give and about being the custodian of that and helping it through its life. So they're all fermented um, crushed full cluster and only in small vessels. Um, the reason being is because it's 100% whole cluster, I don't want to over extract the wines. So these are all just natural one punch down a day extraction and only hand punch downs, like literally with my hands. I don't have it on here because it's a Facebook profile, but anyone who knows my Facebook page, it's just my hands in some barrels. And the reason being is it's just that much more intimate experience with the fermentation itself. So if the, the cap, the part that wants to rise of the fermentation is pushing back, you're feeling it with your own hand, where if you're using, um, a machine to do that, you you could risk hurting the vines and over extracting the vine, uh, over extracting the the grapes, um, and then you're also feeling you know the warm patches and the cool patches. So you know that the fermentation is happening evenly in each vessel. Um, and when we press one, we press the the others as well. So they all have the same amount of time on the skins, um, and this from the date of picking. So really everything is as even through these as possible to really highlight the differences in the soil. So, so next we're gonna taste the, the cyst syrup. Uh, cyst syrup is from Aspen. This again used to be a, a blend of two vineyards. It used to be Roundstone plus uh, Klufenberg. We have a very special vineyard on Klufenberg. 
that we've worked with since since 2005. So even before we started Malinu, um, at our previous job, we, we were working with it. Um, so, so basically it was a blend of, of vineyards on both sides of Castilberg. And then since 2015, again, we decided to focus just on Roundstone, the, the Schist vineyard on Roundstone. So we still work with the Klufenberg vineyard and it goes into the, the Malinu Syrah. But this is, uh, yeah, this is a single vineyard on Roundstone. Again, about 20 years old, the vines were planted in 2000. So they're in a fantastic natural balance. Again, they're, they're not old vines yet, but they've, they've reached that stage of maturity where the, the, the vigor has come down, the, the yields are, are very consistent. Um, and we've really put a lot of effort into the farming here, the, the cover crops, the mulches. It's, it's, just a, it's, just, it's an amazing vineyard to just be in because of that natural energy that, that's in the, in the vineyard. Um, and I'll, I'll pull up some pictures just to show you what the soils look like here. Um, so here, here we're on, on Castilberg, so that's, that's the slate. Uh, that's, that's a few meters down, so if you dig a hole about sort of three meters down, you, you hit the bedrock. So, so that's what really what the, the schist looks like. And uh, as you can see, it's kind of got a slightly brown color. Um, so where we are on Castilberg, we have brown slate, or which is which is schist. Um, I think everybody here knows Porcelainburg, so our really good friend Kali. So Porcelainburg is part of the same range of mountains as Castilberg. It's just uh, probably about 15 kilometers to the south, and uh, it's a much more eroded part of the mountain. So so all the brown slate has basically eroded away already, and they and he's planted on blue slate. So blue slate is a bit harder and and much less soil. And slate is all about tannin. So in red wine, slate brings structure to the wine. So yeah, Porcelainburg is extremely tannic and, and it's an incredible expression of, of structure. And schist, round stone is, is kind of a cousin of that. It, it's, it's still a very tannic, very structured wine, but it's got a little bit, we have a little bit more soil. Um, so you also have a nice mid palate to go with all that tannin and structure. Um, so yeah, this is just to show you how the vines, they're literally planted in these slate rocks in the in the brown slate but these rocks at the top you can you can almost take with your hands and break them apart so they're not quite as as rough as, as you would find on the uh, on the blue slate soil um, and yeah th these are young bush vines that we planted here on round stone so this is young syrah that at the moment goes into the the Malinu syrah uh, but eventually could possibly also be a, a schist syrah in, in time and I think th this is just a great picture to show you the, I think we were talking earlier about the more natural farming. So, so even though this is a vineyard we, we planted recently, uh, instead of just planting a huge monoculture of just vines everywhere, we've planted these corridors of feinbos uh, inside the vineyard. So these, these rows of feinbos here were, were planted by ourselves. Um, well, not by ourselves, with the nursery in, in, in helping us. Um, but it's all feinbos that belongs on the mountain. So, so the nursery went and took cuttings in the mountain of little fangos plants, grew them in their nursery and then, and then brought them to the farm when we planted the vineyard. And the idea is that this is a home for, for wasps, for bees, for ladybugs. They nest there, that's their natural home. Um, and then they will go in the, in the day and in the night and feed in the vineyards on any pests that might be there, whether it's um, calanders or aphids or whatever. And, and so they, they naturally keep this wonderful balance that we have in the Swatland in our vineyard. So again, we, we can farm without having to, to spray any heavy chemicals really. So, so just again about trying to, to have a, just a reason, sensible farming practice to, to everything we do. I'll just chat about the contours real quick, yeah, quickly yeah. while those are up there. So you can see that these vines are all planted on the contours, so on curves um, that, that naturally allow the water to penetrate as deeply and not just flow down the mountain um so it moves with the soil with the land it's you know we always say there's there's no straight lines in nature um and there shouldn't be any straight lines in a vineyard so the the um vines themselves will be able to retain more water but one of the most important things is that it helps to retain the very small amount of fragile topsoil that we do have um you know chris mentioned that we have um more topsoil than than porcelainburg but we're talking about a yeah very, it's all relative it's very relative we have a very small amount 
So in the topsoil is where you can conserve natural organic matter. And the more natural organic matter you have, the better you have for being able to dry land farm the vineyards and just natural nutrients that will go to the vine. So you don't have to put artificial nutrients in the vineyard. So it all is a complete, um, you know, a unit, a cycle about being sustainable, not just in how we're farmed, but how, how we're planting um, and how we look to see ourselves in the future as well. Just to get back to winemaking, Tuani's got a question. What's the difference between whole bunch or whole cluster pressing or fermenting yeah. and, and anything else? What, like, what, is, what does that mean and what does it do to the wine? No, it, it, it's, it's very important because it's a very small um, uh, difference in semantics there, but it means something very different. So in whole bunch pressing, or I guess you could say a whole cluster pressing, it just means that everything is entire, uh, the grapes and the stems are still intact. And with the white wine, it means that we put the entire grape bunch into the press. The other technique um, is to take this, the grapes off the stems and then put them in. So that's a space saver, but you're also going to pull uh, flavors out of the skin that for us might not personally be desirable, but it's a, uh, you know, it's up to the, the individual winemaker. But for our winemaking style, doing a whole bunch or whole cluster pressing on the white wines is, is very um, favorable for our style. The, but in red wines, um, that's why I refer to crust, crushed whole clusters, because you can put the whole bunch and ferment that way without crushing it, but then you get carbonic fermentation, which is the fermentation inside a whole berry. You end up with lighter wines, lighter tannins, um, quite, um, I'll just say crunchy, tutti fruity wines. Um, so, so Beaujolais, for example, um, in, in, in many instances. Um, that's also a fantastic technique, but not what we're looking for. So when we do whole cluster, we do crushed whole cluster, uh, which means that it's still, the whole grape, you know, all the skins, all the pips, and the stems still intact, and the the stems themselves um, enhance the characters of the wine. So you do get more tannin, you do get slightly lower acids, um, but not necessarily higher pHs. So that's a whole that's a whole another seminar on its own. Um, but for me, that just enhances. Um, uh, the fragrance, it's a magnifying glass on the terroir, it's more structured, um, but it also is a structure that's not just a, like a blousy structure, it pulls it all together. Um, so we love working with crushed whole clusters for the red wines. Yeah, yeah so I'm, I'm, I've got the, the Shitsera here on my glass and, and really on the nose, it's, it's incredibly complex. Um, I think out of all the, the, the Syrahs we work with, it's, it's almost the most complete vineyard. We're, we're able to make a Shitsera every year. Uh, because it really is a vineyard that's just in a, such a great balance. Uh, on the nose, you get a lot of darker fruit here. So, so like blue blueberries, sort of that, that dark fruit character, plums, that, th those kind of aromatics. Um, there's definitely a lot of spice as well. So the, here you have some bunches that are a bit more in the sun on the vine. So, so you're going to get that more sort of fruit char character coming. But then at the same time, you do have some bunches that are a little bit in the shade. So the spice comes through there. So quite a lot of layers of, of different flavors. Um, and then the palate, I always find with, with, the, with the schist serum, it, it has that wonderful backbone, that structure to it. Um, but it's, it's got also this nice velvety texture. So it's, it's not an aggressive tannin. It's quite a kind of a sophisticated tannin, I suppose. Almost not chalky, but it's, but it's, it's, a, it's a very pleasant tannin to it. It's, it's not rough and you think, oh, I, I need to let this wine age for five or 10 years before I can drink it. It's beautiful now. But that structure means that it can age. It has the ability to, to age incredibly well. So this, in a way, is one of the Syrahs that, that's kind of any time, you know, you, you, if you're someone who loves drinking young Syrah, it's beautiful now. It's, it's very serious. But at the same time, it has that backbone and, and that ability to age incredibly well. And I always taste in shapes. Um, and so where the granite has that long linear tannin, this has more of a square tannin on the palate. So it, it fills it more, it's, it's, it's more um, uh, built on the palate. Um, and I absolutely love that for that um, mm -hmm. kind of combination of ageability and length, but just giving you this presence right now. And then Andrea, the Iron Syrah, let's chat about that. Um, so Iron Syrah, this is from uh, North of Malmesbury. 
these. So I'll pull up a picture. Yeah, maybe just chat about what, what makes these saws interesting, what makes them different. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so it, for us, you know, the, the wine that comes off of the soil is always the most important thing. But when we get geological students from around the world that flock to these soils, these um, coffee clip soils, the iron rich um, gravelly bit of clay in there. These, these are actually some of the oldest viticultural soils in the world at about 400 million years old. Um, and that deep red rich decomposed um, iron in the soil, sorry, it, it cannot get any more decomposed than where it is now, which means no matter how much more time and pressure that's applied to these soils, this is the this is the, the end of the line for how these soils will evolve, which is really, really rare in the world. Um, and it just happens to make some of the most expressive, exciting wines as well. So on the iron soils, um, you know, that deep red, rich character of the soil itself translates into the wine by giving us deep red, rich characters. So if you want to talk about yeah. the, what you're picking up. Yeah. So, so the thing here to, to kind of understand is the iron soils are very rich in clay. Um, and clay obviously is, is very useful in a vineyard because clay holds moisture and nutrients. So, and, the, and these soils have a very high clay content. So they keep a lot of, a lot of nutrients and a lot of moisture in them. So when it rains, they, they hold all that water in the, in the soil. But what's interesting is they, they feed the vine in the early season. Uh, so the vines grow lovely and, and um, yeah, they're, they're very, very happy. But what starts happening is later on in the season, so sort of around Christmas time, New Year's, um, when Veraison starts, when the grapes start turning from white and they start getting color and turning into red grapes, the vines themselves actually need quite a lot of water to, to photosynthesize and, and drive that process. So they start taking quite a lot of water off the soil. But then eventually the clay itself actually starts fighting against the vines and it holds that moisture back. So it keeps the vines quite small and it keeps the, ver the berries very small. So, so these are our, always our smallest berries uh, that we pick. They're literally like tiny little peas. Um, and what's also interesting is they don't have very thick skins. So, so it's, it's Syrah that has a lot of sort of density, a lot of concentration, quite a kind of a brooding character on the, on the nose. So think dark fruit again, but, but then you start thinking of also other things. So we, <laughs> yeah, we, we often say hemoglobin. So it's, it's, um, yeah, bloody, I suppose, like meaty. Um, there's like a rusted iron character tomato leaf, um, so all those aromatics come through. So it's, it's far more on the sort of tertiary spectrum. There is some dark fruit, of course, but, but there's, there's many more sort of other aromatics that, that you wouldn't find in the, in the granite syrah or the, or the schist syrah. And then the color is always, it's always the darkest of the three because it's these tiny little berries with thin skins, the, the color gets released very, very quickly. So it's a very dark, very, very sort of deep concentrated wine. And naturally on the palate, it has a lot of weight. So, so it's a very velvety, very, very dense wine. But what's interesting is, is the last few vintages with the drought, the, the bunches have been extremely small. I mean, they're literally five centimeters or six centimeter size bunches. Uh, and because we're doing these wines whole bunch, where, where you don't de-stem the grapes, the, the, there's a lot of stems in the tanks uh, compared to the amount of berries. So you're going to pick up actually in these wines a lot of tannin as well, which comes from more from the stems than from the berries themselves. So, so in a vintage like 2015, they would have been, the wine would have been very round, very velvety, very plush. Um, whereas in 2016, 17, and 18, that, that character is there, but it's also framed by the tannins from the stems. So I think it's a, yeah, a really great representation of iron sores, but also of the vintage, where the vintage is showing itself quite nicely in the iron syrah. And what's quite important to realize is that, you know, with iron soils, sorry, syrah planted on iron soils, you could easily get a wine that's almost overly voluptuous, overly plush, and, and that kind of wine we would never put into our iron syrah. The reason being is it, it must still be a balanced wine, and that's why we're so excited by the 2018 vintage of iron is, um, you know, it's, it's round and red and, and it has that plushness, plushness um, with those round tannins that defines iron, but it has the structure and the length 
that's going to make it like an amazing aging wine and a world-class wine. Mm -hmm. And the same with, you know, the schist. The schist is about structure, but it still has freshness and it still has mid-palate. And then the granite is about length and freshness, but again, it still has enough um, gusto behind it to yeah. make all three of these really complete wines. So uh, Milo is asking here, what shape are the tannins in the irons here? <laughs> the, the iron sirah tannins are definitely round. <laughs> so, so like long and angular, almost like a, almost like a um, stalactite for, for granite, boxy and square for the schist and, and just round for the iron. Are there any other shapes for wine? Plenty of uh, shapes. Yeah. There's actually, this is a whole other story, but there's actually amazing um, tasting notes out there that are done just in visual and in shape form. And I can, cool. I can recommend a few out there if anyone wants. Cool. So, yeah, so th those are the, the five wines this, this uh, release. Um, I think yeah, we're, we're super proud. Obviously, we will only ever release a wine that we think is beautiful and, and represents its site and the vintage. So I think these, these five certainly do that. We're, yeah, we're, and we're, we're really excited to be releasing them this year. Um, as I said, that some, of the, some of them are made in pretty small volumes, so there is yeah, not a lot of them to go around. But um, yeah, we, we are, again only want to release wines that we're, we're super, super happy with. Um, and I think we're, we're shipping them from the 14th of September. So just around the corner in a, in a few weeks time. And um, yeah, we, we look forward to, to sharing them with you guys, with your customers. Um, they are in South Africa available through Meridian. So um, if anybody's looking for them, they are through Meridian. But please, please uh, trade customers in South Africa, contact Nicola. She's really the, the point of contact. Uh, we want to try and keep a close relationship with, with you guys. So, so if you have any questions on, on allocations or availability or, or want to yeah, try, and, try and get some stock, please um, feel free to, to get a hold of Nicola. She's really, um, especially with the single terroir wines, it's very important that, that we don't just hand over the, you know, the relationship to, to Meridian. They're, they're a fantastic company and um, doing a great job for us, but we, we want to make sure that, that we're understanding your needs and, and you're understanding um, what we're up to. So, so yeah, deal with your Meridian rep, but please also keep Nicola in the loop that, that we're aware of what's happening there. Um, and, and yeah, anything else, Nick, Andrea? Yeah, we, we already have um, some scores that are still under embargo, but we're very, very happy with them. Um, but I mean, you know, just in reference to last year's wines, just, um, you know, the, all the Syrahs were Plata's five stars, including um, Granite being Syrah of the year um, and up to 97 points last year. So, you know, we, we just, we're so happy with the track record of this because these are the wines that we just, are so connected with and have so much passion for. And for us, we're not making wine for journalists, but when we're rewarded or awarded, you know, amazing scores and accolades for something that we love doing, for that, for us, that's like the ultimate um, uh, goal of what we want to achieve is that we love making it and people love drinking them. Yeah. So, yeah. so thank you everybody. If anybody has any more quick questions, you're welcome to pop them in. But otherwise, we just want to say yeah, thank you for, for making time on your, on your Friday mornings. Um, I know a lot of retailers, we, we're not allowed to be selling wine right now. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's great, great to, be, to be with you all. And um, hope you all have a fantastic weekend wherever you are. Um, we're looking forward to some, some awesome weather here in the Cape. And uh, Jonah, I hope it's all good there in, in Joburg. Colleen as well. Um, yeah, hope you guys have a fantastic weekend. And, yeah, look forward to... Honestly, come and come out and visit us as soon as you can, and we we can share these all in in person. That that's the best way to do it is to taste with you guys personally. But I'm so glad you joined us today. Yeah, thank you guys. Keep well. Have have a great weekend. <laughs>